Yeah, thank you very much and uh, also thank you to the organizers to have me here in Stockholm. It's always a great pleasure to come to Sweden um, since many years. Very pleased to see my, my earliest collaborator from Sweden from the 1980s, Ulf Lindberg, is here. So, um, yeah, it's always very nice to come to Sweden and speak about conservation of cultural heritage. And today I was asked to speak. What should I do? The microphone up? Like this? Okay. Um, yeah, to talk a little bit about what do we measure in museums. I mean, we've heard a lot about risk management, but uh, we measure a lot of parameters which are actually around our objects and, and how do we sometimes measure conditions and parameters of our objects and sites. Um, parameters accessible to measurements relate to the environment, like temperature, humidity, electromagnetic radiation, such as UV radiation or light, visible light, physical forces, we heard about that in, in the morning, pollutants, biological contamination, Thomas was speaking about that. Um, but we also can see where this environment is actually active, and that's the museum and sites, and I tried to mix that, mix that a little bit between historic buildings, sculptures, uh, monuments, but also the museum context and the different levels to an exhibition area, storage, offices, to the display cases. And of course, what is most interesting is our objects and, uh, and the artifacts and how do they respond to changes in the environment? How do they deform? What is the hygric dilatation, the hygric swelling and shrinkage, mechanical damage, fissuring, cracking, surface recession of bronze monuments, of stone uh, artifacts, fading of dyes and pigments and, and general corrosion. If we look at objects, how do they change over time? I mean, a very popular tool is, is photography. Our eyes and then making photography. And here you can see a marble sculpture over the year, over six years' time, and in red on the right side, actually, how some areas were just lost over that period of time, um, you know, comparing before and after. Um, the rain and the acid rain especially, but the rain is washing away our surfaces and if we take um, recourse to advanced technologies such as RTI, reflection, transformation, imaging, we can make some of these uh, traces of the history visible again. We can actually read inscription which are not accessible to the bare eye with reflection, transformation, imaging. Besides that, we can also translate this imaging into 3D topographies. We can actually calculate the depth and the heights of the profile. Um, early approach to find out what happens actually with cultural heritage were exposure programs. The first one started more than 100 years ago, um, beginning of the 20th century. One, one program which actually led us to Sweden, to Gothenburg and to Stockholm was a program called um, Eurocare, Euromarble, EU496. And the exposure site actually was on the roof of the Royal Castle in Stockholm. And that's how, within the years, some of the items changed. Uh, for example, by just iron content oxidized, uh, the dolomitic marble from Ekeberia in Sweden became more and more yellow over eight years, and cracks and, and surface fissures became more depth. Um, you can see this on a, a silicon cast in the scanning electron microscope before exposure and only after nine months. So that's another way to, to quantify actually change of surfaces. Well, I have to mention that because that's where I originally come from. Um, the measurements of ultrasonic pulse velocity, the look into the objects, to the inside of the objects. Ultrasonic velocity tells us something in stone about how dense is the stone, how porous is it, how is the water saturation, and how, how strong actually is that stone. And it's a, it's a method which you can apply repeatedly over the years. You can do it again and again, and you can compare your values, and you can see, well, does it change, does it not change? This, uh, this uh, slide shows you the development between 1992 and 2011. And you can see there is some change on that sculpture in the old Southern Cemetery of Munich. It's actually getting worse slowly. Um, but you can also see that, I mean, 
how often will I have an opportunity to measure that again, right? I mean, you see, in the next 10 years, I may be too weak to go out on the scaffolding. So my next generation, my successors have to do it. And they need a method which they can apply and get a result which they then can compare to my result. And that is really an important thing. Characterize an object in a way that you get a value which you can compare to a value somebody else was measuring before. I mean, there's many conservatives among you, and you all know conservation reports where you see, oh, the, you know, the artificial filling on that uh, travertine stone is a little bit yellow. And then you read that after 20 years, and it's still yellow, but you don't really know, is it now more yellow or, or less yellow? And I mean, to, to turn conditions into numbers, reproducibly measurable numbers, is really an important thing which is very closely related also to what we have been discussing all uh, this morning uh, about the risk management. Um, I go now to some examples for light, mechanical vibration, physical forces, and if I have time at the end, to the hottest topic in the museum world, which is the climate. But that really depends how much time I will now waste for light and uh, vibrations and uh, physical forces. So light. Um, well, we all know that the lower the frequency, the higher the energy, the higher the potential damage electromagnetic radiation can cause. And um, if you take a look at your paintings in the collections, these are two examples from Dresden. Um, you see the, the frame-covered background is dark magenta. All the rest has faded in this painting by Ferdinand von Reisky. Or in another example, Otto von uh, Otto Dix, you can see here in this area, it was a little bit more pink than actually the exposed area. So a lot of pigments, a lot of dyes change and actually fade. One way to measure that, one way to, to um, put that condition into a number is by using a tool called MFT, Micro Fading Tester, developed by Paul Mittmore at that time at Carnegie Mellon University, now actually um, a colleague of mine at Yale uh, with his group. That is um, here one example, for example, of a lithograph tested uh, the Papillons plate 17, and they tested in comparison to the blue wool standard, which some of you may know, it's a standard for, for light uh, fastness, uh, blue wool standard 1, 2, and 3, and they found out that, well, some of these colors are quite stable, but the pink actually, you know, refers to the um, blue wool standard 1, so it's not really uh, very stable, so that means the recommendation after the test is to exhibit it cautiously, but um, monitor the pink areas continuously for fading. You can do that with the microfading tester because it is considered to be a non-destructive testing. You are fading a little little areas of less than a millimeter square, and you're not burning holes into the object. And you can if you want, but you can stop the experiment earlier. What is important with the light is that you avoid a situation like this one. It's a very famous painting by Caravaggio in San Luigi di Francesi in Rome. Um, please note this thing here, like no photography, no flash, right? That's a please no flash because it's so dangerous to have flash for paintings. But then you get like 40,000 lux from the, from the window at the noon with the direct sunlight. So you can do a lot of photography before you get this effect. Uh, I mean, this is a lot of hypocrisy in our museums about fading. I don't know about photography. I don't know how it's in Sweden. Um, I remember in Germany in 2010, they said no more photography in Nefertiti's uh, room in the new museum. And I got an email from the National Gallery in Washington. Everybody said, you know, are you crazy? I mean, don't you know that the flash is not really... I mean, Nefertiti is 3,300 years old. It's Egyptian blue, hematite, ore pigment. A little bit of calcite, I mean, those are not among the most fading pigments in, um, on the planet. And, but, yeah, people think no flash, no photography is good against fading. It might be good for the papillon, for these for this, uh, lithographs, which I was showing just before, but it's definitely not the, the, the answer for everything. And, and here I would definitely agree with what Thomas has just said, that the thinking is probably more important than just the action. Physical forces, something which comes, I mean, in the daily life of conservators, right, in the museum, um, 
when you have to move works of art, I mean, the thing, you shouldn't like laugh because one thing is really correct because these paintings are like perpendicular to the movement of, so they're not like, right? I mean, any, any breaking, any acceleration doesn't really go on the canvas. They're actually put in the right direction. But nevertheless, it could rain, for example, or something else could happen. Um, I want to show an example uh, from the new museum in Berlin where, where actually we measured something around an object. That is our most famous object in the Berlin collection, the bust of Nefertiti. And um, you can see here the secondary mounting frame which we designed in 2009 because we realized that over the years, the last 100 years, um, the handling of this bust was always done by just grabbing her neck and taking her somewhere and I mean I'm not I don't want to be like really too offending but archaeologists think that as long as they take gloves that's all fine you know so we thought when we saw her that that we shouldn't we should avoid that we should do the handling for cleaning in a way that nobody ever has to touch the sculpture anymore so we constructed that secondary mounting system and what we also did was we constructed the sockle and the and um, the pedestal for, for exposing it in the new museum. And it's a four meter high uh, display case. And it's in a room, you know, it's a building technique by Stühler. The, the, the floor is moving a lot. It's very, uh, there's a lot of movement in this floor. So together with our colleagues from the Technical University of Berlin, we, we wanted to see how is this floor moving because we wanted to re reduce the vibration on the bust in the in the display case, and um, so we asked the interns, like 30 interns, to walk and measure, you know, what happens with this floor. And um, you can see the the vector here is moving a lot um, because it's like a, I don't know how this is in English, but it's like a, an effect of you know it's like multiplied because from the floor it goes over a four meter high display case. The, the, the dilatation is actually quite high. Um, so what we did, we, we, we induced uh, the um, insulators, vibration insulators. It was quite a cheap thing, it was 287 euro and once they found out that it's for Nefertiti's display case, they just give it for free. Um, after these insulators were there, just look at this vector now. The movement of the floor remains the same, but the sockle doesn't move anymore. 90% of the movement is gone. And, and here we are in a situation where we say, well, no movement, hopefully less damage, right? More movement, more damage. But it's a vague correlation. If you go directly to the object, one example I would like to show is about a painting by Ludwig Meitner, a uh, new national gallery in Berlin called The Revolution, Body Kartenkampf. Um, the vibration the engineers, they measured the movement of the canvas before the conservation, you can see there's a lot of movements going on here, in, especially in the area, I can go back, of the face, this area. Um, after the consolidation, after the structural consolidation of the paint and the new um, clamping, the new, you know, of the canvas, you see it's much more homogeneous. It's not that it, the, the, the variation has uh, disappeared, but it's in a different way, what is called actually, um, I'm looking for Bill, eigenform and eigenfrequencies. Um, and actually, Kerstin Kracht did it, who learned her craft with Bill Vai at the ICN. Um, so what, you could, what we could see is that the, the frequencies of the canvas were increasing after the consolidation treatment, which is actually good, because with vibration insulation systems, you can only interfere with frequencies above three, Hertz, they're below three hertz, you cannot really dampen them. Um, but we could also, of course, see that there is still a lot of structural damage due to the over tension, uh, in, especially in the area of the, of the face, we could see that here. So that the, 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 the amplitudes of the, of the uh, vibration are still high. Um, I didn't say the most funny thing about that painting is that it's painted from both sides. It's a canvas which is actually painted from the one side and from the other and should be shown from both sides too, which makes it a little bit difficult for 
mean, you cannot just hang it on the wall. It has to be in the room and then it has to be stabilized. And I think our colleagues are still working on that. I unfortunately left in April for Yale University. So I don't know really how the new mounting system looks for the Meidner painting. Air pollution, indoor air pollution, very brief excursion to that. Um, an important topic in, in museums, everybody knows about the audit test, very simple test to assess materials, whether they are compatible in display cases. Um, you can also monitor pollutants through passive samplers in the cases. You can do it with, you know, for example, for ozone, a very fashionable pollutant at the moment with elastomeric dosimeters, um, which latex strips which age very in, a, in a good correlation between ozone concentration and um, the cracking and the, 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 the discoloration. At some point, these latex strips even actually break down. So that's in the Aleppo room of the National Museum, inside and outside. It's a very good uh, parameter. But you can, if we go a little bit closer to the objects and what the objects are doing, you can measure uh, hydrogen sulfur emission from degrading proteins in old photographies or peroxide emissions from degrading iron gull ink drawings directly with sensors put. I mean, that's not scotch tape, right? That's non non-reversible and non-destructive, but you can measure emissions directly from the objects um, in the collection. And for example, also quantify dust deposition. Where it is, where the people are moving in the museum, uh, where people are, what, what people are bringing, I mean, like from hair to the textile fibers to mineral uh, particles. And of course, when you speak about monitoring and impact of pollutants, of course, we have to Speak about IPM, integrated pest management. A uh, close colleague of mine, Bill Landsberger, uh, implemented that project at the National Museum in Berlin. We were probably the first museum in Germany to employ a biologist for, for, for that purpose. And I still, looking back to my 10 years in Berlin, I think it was one of my smartest decisions to get a biologist to the staff because he found uh, things everywhere. At some point, I thought maybe he's bringing these little animals also. But he always said, no, there's no need, you know, yeah, they are everywhere. So he's, he did this monitoring and I, I'm very happy to hear that now, I think also with colleagues from Sweden, there is now a standard, a European standard on IPM. Um, it's a very, very important um, uh, part of the museum work and, and the preservation work. I just wanted to show, for example, one day he identified dry wood termites. I mean, they're not really at home in Berlin, but, but in our museum collection with the big boats, they are. And so he implemented, you know, monitoring, identified these dry wood termites, which apparently don't need anything, just the boats, you know, just the artwork, and then um, eradicated it with low oxygen treatments. Um, I'm looking for Anna. How many minutes do I still have? Oh, good, so I can go to the climate. Um, the climate, the museum climate, the good museum climate. I removed all the slides from the past 20 years about the museum climate and because it's such a hot topic. I mean, uh, the Green Museum, I did this road show in Germany. Um, I have um, the VDR, the German Restorers Association, wrote a letter that I'm I'm like putting into doubt these long-term traditional 50% flat lines, you know, because it's all about flat lines in my country. You know, everybody says 50% flat is the good museum climate. Um, but, you know, some, at some point the news from the United States also arrived to Germany. Some, at some point the people realized that there's a discussion going on since the 1990s about the good museum climate. And that has a lot to do with risk management and sustainable conservation and even carbon footprint. There are so many people out there who are much more interested in the carbon footprint than in the preservation of cultural heritage. And I think we have to, we have to keep that, I mean, in our mind. So the only uh, a quote which I want to mention at this point here is the, the plus minus dilemma, which probably are, most of you are familiar with at the AIC meeting in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 2010, that responsible and efficient environmental control has become essential. And um, 
in Germany, two conferences were dealing with this. Um, one in Munich in November 2012, organized by Andreas Burmeister and Melanie Eibel, uh, which can be summarized in the sentence, stable is safe and the Munich position on climate and cultural heritage. And then another conference which we organized in Berlin on the occasion of the 120 year anniversary of our laboratory, where we actually are very happy to have also speakers from Sweden, Tor Brostre, um, about heritage science and sustainable development for the preservation of art and cultural assets on the way to the Green Museum. Um, and both positions and both conferences are on the internet. You can listen to the lectures and you can hear uh, actually, also some of the famous people who were mentioned in the morning by Agnes, like Stefan Michalski or Jonathan Ashley Smith. So, very brief, conservation requests on the room climate are actually low temperature, would be good. I mean, artifacts don't really need 20%, 20 degrees Celsius because they're not freezing. They don't have, like, work, uh, workers' safety... Uh, <sighs> regulations. We have that in Germany. You cannot have lower temperatures than 19 degrees in the museum. Um, it would be good actually for many objects to have 15. But that's a little bit the hypocrisy, right, which we have in our collections. We say, oh yeah, it's good for the artifacts, but it has to be 20 degrees. No, for our artifacts, it doesn't have to be 20 degrees. It has to be low. Not too cool, but no. Relative humidity should be according to absorption characteristics. Both parameters should be mostly constant, low airspeed in the vicinity of the objects. Well, as Thomas was uh, speaking about uh, microbiology, in some cases you might want to have a little bit higher airspeed too. <laughs> but uh, in general, low airspeed because you don't want to have dust. And of course, you also should remove dust from the air volume. And that's this famous picture that you have different materials, different relative humidities. You have a white zone, a caution zone, which is yellow, and a red zone, which you should avoid. But please keep in mind that this is actually a very typical example for just looking at the environment. This is not looking at the object. What we should do is we should really learn more how the object is responding to that. Of course, these are empiric data. They come from Gary Thompson, from the museum environment. In essence, they come from the Second World War when the National Gallery put paintings to the tube in London and they found out that they're actually quite much better in the tube than they are in the museum. Um, I mean, stable, right? And then they realized, ah, because of the relative humidity, it's very stable there. Relative humidity wouldn't be an issue in our collections if we wouldn't have visitors. Unfortunately, we have visitors. I mean, we have visitors, which means that we have to open the door in the morning and to close it in the evening. Um, which is also good, right? Because we also heard that this morning about accessibility. <laughs> Um, of, of cultural heritage. Uh, one example, the National Gallery in, in Berlin, an, a nightmare from building physics, just steel and glass, you know. Um, that's, for example, the reality in many of our museums. I mean, I could show you a lot more from, you know, museums in the United States and China. We did a lot of this, but this is a very nice example from the uh, Mies van der Rohe building in Berlin. That's the relative humidity. Is like 50% going down to like 25, right? Uh, well, why? Because, you know, with the temperature gradient, with the window, with the sun coming in, it's, it's kind of impossible to get 50% flat. So don't believe facility reports from any museum in the world telling you that they have 50% plus minus one or two. It's just not true. At some point, I thought maybe I should collect these examples and just present them from the Metropolitan Museum to the National Museum of China to Tokyo. To, but it's boring because really there is no such museum which has 50% flat. Well, yes, the Pinacothek in Munich is because Andreas Burmeister is saying stable is safe, so they have like 50% flat, but I didn't measure there. That's a very good example how this National Gallery looks when you have 20 degrees minus outside in a winter night and somebody tries to make 50% flat inside. You get an indoor fountain at the, at the windows, it's condensating and it's freezing to ice and running down. No, that explains that you cannot have 50% flat in that, in that building. But 
going to the objects, what we should know and should learn is how the objects respond to this change in relative humidity and how much of a change is actually acceptable. And here we have, you know, when we switch from like 30 to 90% relative humidity, the red bar, how, let's say, clay-rich materials like Adobe are reacting. They are expanding with the increasing humidity and shrinking with the drying. And, and actually, if you repeat that, in most cases, it's kind of reversible. So we are in this elastic range where you, you shrink, you, you, know, you go. I mean, if you forget for a second the issue of fatigue, it's not so bad. It becomes bad when, when you have, for example, salt, and you get increasing amplitudes, and you get really damaged through salt crystallization in the stone. Um, but as long as this process is just reversible, it's not so bad. So that's, for example, a, a test of um, oak in radial direction, oak wood. You can see this very typical uh, response in dilatation. One thing which I would like to mention here is um, that people always say that, ah, a lot of cycles is bad and, and like long time you know, between the cycles is good. You can see here that actually fast cycling is not so bad because the material doesn't reach the amplitude. The long, here we, don't, we didn't even reach the amplitude. If we would have gone for a little bit longer, like 12 hours, we would have higher amplitudes and maybe a higher risk also for damage. So actually fast fluctuation in itself is not as bad. So I'm, I'm coming to the, the end. It's not like, a, you know, it's like, not like preaching, but I mean, there's something which was said by Jonathan Ashley Smith 20 years ago that most of our objects could be probably robust, robust enough to be lent from 50 plus minus 15 percent of relative humidity. Um, this is now reflected in the BISO interim guidelines, the BISO group interim guidelines from 2012, where as a tentative guideline, the museums, the large museum collections say, let's try and see how 4060 is as a corridor for relative humidity. Of course, it says explicitly that a conservator's evaluation is essential in establishing the appropriate environmental condition. This is not said we have to have 4060. It includes the conservator's view on that. And going back to Gary Thompson, whom we owe this 50% flat thing, right? Gary Thompson wrote in his book that we have to erect this framework of preventive conservation before rather than after our research has reached a dignified level of completion. We need to do more research, we need to discuss more about the good museum climate. We are still not at the end and so I think, and I'm closing with this, that sustainable conservation is definitely not a protocol. It's definitely not something you say, I have to have 50% flat. First of all, because you don't get it. Second, because you cannot pay for it, it's too expensive. Third, because it not necessarily is really important and necessary. And fourth, I think which is most important, you need to develop the preservation, the preventive conservation in the dialogue between all the parties involved. And you need to look at it as a process. You're here, there, and you're moving towards the goal tomorrow. It is not a protocol which is like ex cathedra uh, conveyed and we have to stick to it. No, we, we have a process here and we are still in the middle of our way to the Green Museum. Thank you.